Stellar Festival with Stellar students and Stellar faculty. I've, I've heard about this festival for years, and Ms. Hennies and I go back a ways, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'd like to thank Rebecca Pennies for the title of this little talk, which is Deciphering New Scores, which you all have been doing. I, I hear uh, learning some pieces of mind which you were not given a lot of time to learn, right? Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about what do we do when we're faced with a new score and there's no recording. I know what I would do if I were given a new score. Where's the first place you might go if, if somebody gives you a new piece of music? That's where I'd go, to YouTube. And what if there's nothing there? What if there's no recording? Well, then we have to use other resources and, and see what happens. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the printed score itself and how you might use that as a springboard to entering the world of the new piece. So you're given a score. It's really like a road map, but you have no image. You don't know what the landscape is, what the terrain is, what it looks like. It can be really overwhelming just to see a bunch of notes. I'm curious um, who of you have played, not my piece, but um, who of you have played pieces by 21st century composers? That's a, that's a good amount. Um, who's played a piece by a composer you've never heard of until you got that piece? Okay, interesting. Um, and as, as we said, your immediate response would probably be to go to YouTube. So if we're given a new piece by Chopin or Mozart, even if we don't know that specific piece, we have a definite sound rule in our ear of all the familiar works of, of, that we know of Chopin and Mozart. So if you're given a Mozart piece, you expect a certain clarity of form or a certain transparency of sound. If you're given a Chopin piece, perhaps a long, winding, sinuous melody or dramatic mood shifts. But when you tackle the new piece, where do you begin? Remember, there's no recordings, there's no MIDI playback, there's, nothing, there's no sound. Well, I'm going to suggest a few things that uh, might give you a fresh way to think about this. Some of you would be inclined to go to the piano and play through the work. Who, who would do that? Get your hands, get your ears in it, right? Um, and that can be a great entry into it. Is if you're already a good sight reader, you, you know, you can figure out the lay of the piece and how it fits the hands, maybe where the difficult passages are. Um, and uh, obviously you'd be dealing with the actual sound world. But before you, you do that approach, I would suggest something else you might try. Google, Wikipedia are great resources. I would start by actually re researching the composer. Where is she from? When did she live? Uh, what was going on in the world when um, they were writing the piece? Where did they draw inspiration? Um, from nature? From musical forms that already exist? from political or social situations. More and more, it seems like composers are using music as a direct political or sociological protest. And I'd like to point out that Ursula Oppens is a great heroine of mine when I was a student, and really one of the, I think, one of the forefront pianists of playing pieces by Frederick Chevsky that had great political import. And I hope um, Ms. Oppens will speak about that later, because that is a very, very important composer that we lost in the past couple of months. Um, you might ask yourself, are there pop influences? Beatbox? You know, it could be anything. In this day and age, we're living in a great crossroads of, of um, musical synthesis. Folk music from their native land? Who influenced these composers that you don't know anything about? Were they part of a stylistic school? or a group of artists in other art forms. For instance, you know, it's easily to it's easy to look at someone like Debussy and, and figure out why he was attracted to Mallarmé or Pierre Louis or other French com, uh, poets. And, th and this is interesting too, and I've learned a lot about Bach by looking at a pieces of his which use texts, texts, oratorios, motets, um, the masses, etc. Choral works. You can learn a lot by um, a, about a composer by looking at the um, text that they set. Um, and the more you delve into this, 
the more you'll see that music is never really purely abstract. It's, it's tied to human emotion, human images, whatever, so many different things. Um, so I'm suggesting that even though you haven't heard a note yet, there's a lot you can learn by, by investigating some of these things. So suppose you poked around a lot and discovered a context for the piece. Then I would step back. Actually, I just stepped back. I wouldn't think of that. Um, and I'd look at the entire score as a visual object, not at individual notes or anything like that. Just take it in as a visual map. Like you would an impressionist painting, you know, you get right up on a Monet and all you see are a bunch of brush strokes, and you step back and you see how it solidifies into a landscape or a still life or whatever. Um, you could, you know, think of something like the second ballade of Chopin without even hearing a note of it, just looking at the opening bars of this gorgeous, pulsating, undulating, hymn like passage, and then these stormy interruptions that happen with those cascading runs down and up, you can tell something about the drama of the piece and by those textual um, contrast. I would look for repetition. Is there an obvious form? Is it an ABA form or whatever? You may not see any formal thing that jumps out at you, but that can be helpful if, um, if you're approaching something and see areas of repetition. So after I'd given the score once over, I'd start zeroing in on some more musical things. What's the character of the piece? Can, can you tell that just by looking at it? Sometimes the tempo or the character markings can really help. Descriptive words can help you unlock the flavor of a piece. Of course, the majority of um, musical instructions are in Italian, but as music evolved, especially in the late 19th century, composers began writing um, directions in German, French, and English. And they can unlock many aspects of the piece. It could be somber, playful, frantic, or furious. Then I would look over and see if there's anything harmonically that jumps out. Not in a, forget theory class, I'm not talking about Roman numerals and, and little numbers, uh, but just kind of an overview. Is there a key signature? Does it change keys? Is the harmonic language perhaps not so key oriented but more chromatic? Maybe there's not a key at all. Does it look dissonant, atonal, or even incomprehensible upon first glance? And also the meter and the rhythmic language can tell you something about the piece. Does it look like a waltz? Does it look like a presto? Is it a perpetual motion piece with non-stop energy? Do the time signatures change? And what effect might these rhythmic things have on your understanding of the piece? Are there complex rhythms or polyrhythms or interesting rhythmic layerings? Finally, I would think of it as a piano piece. Uh, does it look like a piano texture that you're familiar with? How does it lie on the keyboard? Is the right hand melodic, as much piano music is, with an accompanying left hand? Think of the Chopin nocturne model, which is sort of classic. Is there counterpoint in both hands? Maybe the piece isn't melodic at all. Maybe it's a texture piece or a rhythm piece. Is it angular or percussive? Does it have stylistic similarities to other pieces that you've, um, that you've learned? So remember, at this point, you haven't even heard one note of the composition, but look how much you could know. So I want to turn now to a piece of mine that you all have uh, been investigating the past few days. How long have you all had the pieces? Not weeks, right? Four days. Four days, wow. I'm glad I don't have to learn in four days. <laughs> um, well, Miss Kennys and I thought it would be a great, this piece actually was on YouTube, a very good performance. But we decided that this experiment of facing the score without any preconception, we should actually pull the uh, YouTube performance. So I got a hold of the uh, pianist, Richard Masters, and I said, can you pull that off of YouTube for a while? He said, sure. <laughs> but he said he was sorry that he couldn't influence all you fine pianists by listening to his recording. So this is called The Book of Blue Flowers. It's from 2010. Um, there was a horrible Gulf oil spill, you might remember, but you probably don't because it was a while ago. Um, and I was asked by the Audubon Society to write a piece 
celebrating something in nature. Um, I actually, it was a very small scale uh, event, and I actually um, premiered the piece, so um, I feel for you, because <laughs> there are some hard passages. Uh, it was later done at Weill, at, at Carnegie Recital Hall. When I was a kid, um, someone said to me, you know, blue flowers don't exist in nature. And I didn't say want to bet, but I knew that they did because I'd seen them growing. There's something called the Asiatic dayflower, which is a um, kind of wandering plant that has these tiny, tiny electric blue petals on it. And I'd seen them, and I, they were not plastic. I knew they were real. So I've always been obsessed with blue and, and blue flowers. Um, and uh, incidentally, I am, am very much influenced by landscape myself and have been doing watercolors for quite a while. And uh, there is a set of watercolors that goes with these flowers. Um, you might poke around online because I, I think some of them are, are on Google Images. So I'm gonna, I just want to go through each of uh, a few remarks about each of the seven pieces. Um, the first one is called Plumbago, and believe it or not, I saw it growing outside of my hotel today. And the first time I saw it was in Florida. So it's a very um, delicate five-petal piece, um, and I'll just play you a couple of phrases from it, and then tell you kind of the musical connection. kind of a hard thing to pull off, but um, I had the flower to guide me. So I'm going to just nod my head. <laughs> All right. Um, and you'll see the five bar phrases, I think. So it kind of proceeds with that kind of structure of the five flowers. Let's see what happens when it puts it back up. Okay. Um, the second piece is called Blue-Eyed Grass. It's a tiny stalk, like a blade of grass, which has this delicate six-petal blue flower on the top of it that really does look like a little eye peering at you. It's kind of a storybook flower. Very beautiful flower. Um, one of my former teachers and his wife celebrated their 50th anniversary. So I wanted to see if I could write a piece with just 50 notes in it, which I did. But it didn't seem like enough of a gift, so I repeated the actual um, 50 note passage with an accompanying left hand. So I'll play you a little bit of the original kind of spare version and then I'll show you what I did with it harmonically. So this is the blue eyed grass. list 
rebel lineage, I would say. Um, so I won't attempt to play any of that. Who of you got, <laughs> who of you, who of you uh, got that piece? Great, can't yeah, wait to hear. <laughs> right. Okay. The fifth piece is called Turquoise Trailer with Hydrangea. So I'm from eastern North Carolina, and if you drive out in the country, a lot of people live in mobile homes that have these kind of 50, 1950s uh, co colors on them. And there's a, who knows what a hydrangea bush is? You know, they, they, they form like giant snowballs, kind of, and they can be anywhere from blue to purple to white. But in eastern North Carolina, because of the soil, um, they're this really kind of tacky electric turquoise color. And I love the way that, that those flowers would clash with, with the mobile home. So um, I pictured what would it be like in the 50s to have these radio, have radio music coming out of these, say, two trailers that clashed. So this is kind of in a late 50s doo-wop style. And I think it's pretty obvious as the piece unfolds where the clashing comes in. So you can see there are many things in my pieces that are going on besides pure composition. As soon as I think we think composers just write these things and have no worldly connection, but of course that's not true at all. So there are flower images, pop music images, pieces that celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, and the mor morning of a child. Um, and I hope some of these ideas will help you um, enter the world of these, of these little pieces. You're going to find your own way into discovering, uh, you know, how you enter the world of a new piece. Your intuition is really, my teacher Roger Sessions at Julia said, your intuition is your best friend. That really is what should guide you. Um, so you're, you're going to, you know, feed your imagination, your intuition into how you learn new pieces, of course. But I hope that some of these tools about exploring the roadmap are helpful. And... Uh, I thank you. I, I would welcome questions or comments too. So, 
Thanks for having me here. And I didn't go over. <laughs> yes? Yes, uh, well, well, thank you a lot for being here. And I was just curious, um, which composers would you say are the biggest influences on your style? If oh. any. Mm -hmm. There's so many people that I love. I mean, I... Um, they're... Schubert. Um, more in the realm of 20th century music. I was in school at a time of high modernism and with Roger Sessions I mentioned. It's not so much that his music influenced my style, but his thinking did. Um, and after he died, I had uh, lessons with Elliot Carter, Milton Babbitt, and again, it was more their intellectual and philosophic world than it was the way it sounds. In terms of sound, the composers that first turned me on were Bartok, WC, um, Chopin, later Mozart and Bach. Um, there's a lot of non-classical music that I love. I, I love a lot of singer-songwriter stuff. Johnny Mitchell, Bob Dylan, more recent singer-songwriter types. Um, a lot of what people might call world music is interesting to me, rhythmically, harmonically. There's actually a, a gamelan orchestra in my hometown now, which is great for my students to experience that whole realm of music that has very little to do with Western music. So um, really lots of people influence me. Um, I grew up in the 60s with some rather good pop music, such as Beatles and Stones and all that, and I loved that stuff, I really did. So. But you know, there are people that are sort of your personal favorites too, and as much as I live and adore Beethoven, something about Schubert you know, reaches me at a more personal level that I um, can't let go of. When I'm in times of... <laughs> <laughs> in, in hard times, I turn to Schubert. He's one of my gods. So. Other questions? I was curious to know how much of your composing, especially in these piano pieces, you do at the piano? At the piano. Mm -hmm. um, I like doing at the piano and also away from the piano. And I, there's this image of Beethoven you know, working away at the piano, but he also had a desk beside the piano. Um, where he would get away and think about things and listen away from the fingers, which I think is a kind of great balanced metaphor of how composers can work. You know, obviously the piano can be a great advantage. It can also be a disadvantage if you're just sort of bound by the way things feel, you know. So we all have to come to terms to that. I, I, I got to classical music through the piano. Um, I would say that most of my ideas do not come at the piano, but they, they might get worked out at the piano. Um, but they really, you know, I've got music written on baggage claim checks and napkins and, you know, everything like that. Um, usually things come to me in little gestures, four, five, six notes, a certain rhythm, a certain orchestral sound. And if it comes, I try to get it down because, uh, you know, it's almost like a mosaic. You, you, you build from these little things. So. Anything else? Give me while I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, you mentioned like, the importance of looking at a piece away from the score first. Um, would you say there are any like, major drawbacks of just diving into the score immediately? Not at all. I was only suggesting this because you were given something, a, an opportunity here where there wasn't a sound recording. And as I said, some of you may approach the pieces by sight reading, by going, I, I don't think there's any drawback at all. I do think it's good for, uh, I mean, my per, I do perform some, and I, I do learn a lot by just taking the score away from my fingers. And somehow when you get your fingers out of the way, you can look sometimes more carefully, and maybe listen more carefully, inwardly, to what's going on in the piece. So I, I mean, I think any way that you can enter a piece of music is going to be helpful. This is, I, this is certainly no handbook for how, how to learn a new piece. It was just some ideas that I have. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Thank you.